Back to normal or back to better? That is the question we're going to be addressing today as Tom Burton, the superintendent of Princeton City Schools, talks about how the pandemic really helped the district determine what practices were things that were obsolete and what areas did they need to address. I'm super excited about this conversation and I can't wait for you to dive in with Tom as he's going to talk a lot about creating diverse leadership teams to take action no matter what your position is in the district, and as a leader, not to focus on the role, but focus on the goal. Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire, the Leadership Development Podcast, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. Welcome back, Aspire listeners. I'm so excited for this interview tonight with my awesome friend, Tom Burton, who is a superintendent in the Ohio area, and I cannot wait for everyone to have an opportunity to learn from his wisdom. Tom, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, you're welcome, Josh. I really appreciate being here tonight. So, Tom, before we dive into a bunch of really important leadership topics, I would love to hear about your leadership journey. Sure, Josh. Oh, I certainly did not take a uh, traditional route <laughs> to, to become a superintendent. I really was not, a, as I say all the time, I was not an academician in, in high school at all. I went to school to uh, play sports. That's really what I did. If it wasn't for sports, I don't know what I'd be doing right now. Uh, I knew I needed to have a C average to be eligible, and that's what I did. Uh, it wasn't really until college that the kind of light went on, the academic light went on for me. And, you know, I had a lot of missed opportunities there uh, in high school uh, that I still kind of back and uh, I do have regrets. I'm not one of those people that think they don't ever have regrets. I do. Uh, but ultimately learning and growing and I had an opportunity to play uh, a lot of sports in college. I was a teacher first, then I was assistant principal, then principal, then went central office and then uh, became superintendent really at the twilight of my career. I could have retired at associate tenant, but you know, I love what I do right now at Princeton City Schools. It's this beautifully diverse school district routinely seen as most, if not the most, one of the most uh, diverse school districts in the state of Ohio. And, and we have unbelievable students and staff getting it done. And um, I'll talk later about a quote that I love about, you know, the importance of leadership and what that means about making a difference. It's not about the role. It's about making a difference. And uh, that's why I think I'm here. Uh, and I certainly appreciate you hosting me today. Tom, I loved your story about not the traditional way of going into education and and into leadership. I'm curious, though, with your journey, when was it that you realized that you wanted to become a leader and then go through the steps of not only being an administrator, but then also going into the upper echelons of the leadership roles in a district? You know, that's a fascinating question because Early on, when I was a teacher, I, I was designated a team leader, I think my second year. And uh, one of the things that really kind of resonated with me during that time is that how much we should do for our students. It's the can, should, and need to do more for our students. And I think it was that just really kind of wanting to make the biggest mark I possibly could with our students and having the, you know, the, the diversity of experiences I had, I feel like I could have moved and helped a lot of students. And with that being said, I, I just feel like it's probably my second year in, in, as a teacher that I really wanted to kind of move into administration and try to expand my you know, influence, if you will. Mm -hmm. So Tom, you're in the role of superintendent now. I'm just curious on what that role and responsibility is, because I know a lot of folks, they realize that's kind of the top position of a district, but I don't know if they really truly understand the day-to-day -day operations for that role. Well, it probably fits with my uh, schizophrenic personality perfectly. <laughs> Literally every second can be very different. Yeah. You know, I, I don't try to get into uh, the weeds with the people who we've hired to do a great job. We're frontline people. We have an amazing administrative team and central office and phenomenal uh, building level leaders as well. So a lot of this kind of oversight of programming and problem solving and being available for people. I actually have taken on the role to be the first reporter for COVID hmm. so that I actually understand and get a feel of what's happening. So anytime there's a case in the district, no matter who it is, they call me right. and 
so I've taken on that that role, which I, I think is a really important role, but it's also something that allows me to get a feel of what's going on. And um, I'm out and about in the community quite a bit, so I'm in buildings all the time. And I think that allows people to have access to me, uh, which I think is critical. Uh, additionally, we spend a lot of time in the business sector. So uh, developing business partner relationships is really, really important. So we have crazy, unbelievable, beautiful programs with our business community that we've created, something that, the you know, it's total collaboration. And one of the biggest things that, that uh, is my role, I think, is the whole vision and mission of the district. Mm -hmm. So as we move forward, it's, you know, when I go to speak, I speak quite a bit in the district to make sure that, you know, I'm living that mission each day, which is at Princeton, which is empowering each student for college, career, and life success. Yeah, I love that. I want to tap into the piece about business partners, because I think a lot of folks don't realize that those things are established to help the district. So what, what does that look like for you and for Princeton? Well, you know, we had uh, 38 business partners at a breakfast uh, about three and a half years ago. And um, I looked out and my board of education was there. I was, I was newly uh, appointed. And I looked out in the crowd and said, we're going to have over 100 business partners this time next year. And people thought I was crazy, which I am for many other reasons, but not that. And when people came up to me after and they said, Tom, what are you doing? I said, listen, if it's important, it's important. So we stopped asking the question, like, what can you do for us from business perspective? Like so many times schools are hand out. Yep. My opinion, we need to have our arms out. Like, what can we do for you businesses? So since we did that, I mean, our business ship has grown exponentially. We have over 500 business partners. We had over 100, by the way, one year later. So uh, that was, you know, <laughs> made that come to fruition by a lot of hard, hard work. And But the business partnership aspect is so critical for schools. Mm -hmm. You know, we if we truly believe that education doesn't stop when kids leave, if we truly believe that careers, like we have to help we're the conduit between education and going into their next pathway. So whether it's military, going directly in the world of work or going to college, it's paramount on, on us to make sure that we do every single thing we can so that if they go into career like livable wage job, it's not right. good enough to say, okay, these kids are going to go to military or go to college. What happens after that? So we've really adopted this, this new uh, tagline, if you will, that our community is our campus. We have to partner. And part of the community, obviously, is businesses. And so since uh, kind of flipping the script on that question, we have li literally, people call us every day about what do we need to do to be business partners. And the only time I've ever asked for anything is support for uh, a golf outing we did. But, you know, ironically, for the leaders that are out there, sometimes if you don't ask, you get what you need. Right. Which is diff very different than... You know, the old phrase, you know, you, you know, you don't know what you're going to get unless you ask. But if you're uh, at a point where you can just authentically sit down with businesses and say, what do you need? And right now they're going to say we workers. But what we found is the one on one connections that are partnership breakfast have been unbelievable. We've had over 100 kids that have been hired at our breakfasts. And that's not the intent of the breakfast. Right. Yeah, the kids that we do, the quality of kids that we do, uh, and the businesses see that they are going to come after them. And so we've had great success uh, with kids that have graduated from college, that have come back from the military, that have gone directly into the world of work. But we're working overtime to make sure that our kids are going to be in a position to be able to create gener generational wealth. I love the program that you're talking about of not only building a partnership, but building a relationship with the community. And that's so important for not only the students, but for everybody involved. So I love that piece there. I know you had talked about being a first responder for the pandemic and with coronavirus. And that is one area, obviously, is it's hitting our country and over the world very, very hard. I can't imagine what it is to be like a superintendent in that role during a pandemic. But I also know that you're extremely passionate about you know, the, the areas that were already needing to be addressed before the pandemic, but the pandemic just highlighting them. So what has been highlighted that you feel like really needs to be addressed with or without a pandemic? Josh, I, I've had the pleasure of speaking uh, 
a lot of people uh, across the country, uh, specifically through Zoom during the pandemic, but also most recently in person, mm -hmm. I'm really critical of us as educators. Uh, it should not have taken COVID for us to um, really kind of demand an appreciation, uh, but it did take COVID to have an appreciation for educators. You see video all over the place right now where parents are saying, apologizing to teachers. I'm so sorry. I realized what it was like to have my kid and try to teach them. Yeah. You know, it shouldn't have taken COVID to have parents be parents, to have, uh, to have us get really serious about closing the digital divide, to have you know us truly comprehend food insecurities, to have us authentically design innovative instruction and education to have there be serious, authentic collaboration, not only with parents and students, whatever, but between with administrators, with superintendents, cross district, cross county, across the state and country. It shouldn't have taken COVID to have us fairly fund education and specifically for those that need it most. Yeah. It shouldn't have taken COVID to have us really get serious about equity, uh, but yet it did. And it's, it's really making sure that the lessons that we learned through this horrific pandemic, we don't forget. Right at the beginning of the summer, I heard people start talking about, I can't wait just to get, get back to normal. Like, why do we want to go back? Uh, it, we can learn from what we've experienced, but going back, by and large, is never really positive. So instead of saying, I want to go back to normal, I say, let's go back to better. Yep. Right? We know what we've learned. Uh, we've got better, we've got stronger, we've got more resilient, uh, we've got more creative and innovative, collaborative. So let's build on those experiences. And so that's really what we're trying to do each and every day at Princeton. Yeah, it's so true, Tom. Since we, you've gone through the pandemic and, you know, you said you, you guys are constantly looking to be better and such a great mindset. Is there any practices that happened during the pandemic that you all are starting to realize like, you know what, I don't understand why we didn't do this before. And now that we've done it, we're going to continue it on beyond the pandemic. Yeah. You know, I think there's a lot of getting into the minutia of, of little things like on Hattie talks about effect size. Like what do you do to really move student learning and student achievement? Yep. And so we really got very intentional about that. Not that we didn't talk about it before, but because of the pandemic, opportunity to really kind of dig down deep into some of the instructional methodologies and as well as like what matters most with student achievement. And so some of those things are really great. You know, we've been much more flexible in terms of dealing with parents. So we just had our student conferences not too long ago, our parent teacher conferences, if you will. Yep. So instead of just saying, Hey, you got to come in, which a lot of times parents can't come in for a lot of different reasons. Yep. So we gave parents an option. Not surprising, we had tremendous, tremendous attendance. Mm -hmm. That's what we found even during the pandemic is when it was virtual, we had more conferences than we had the year before. Yep. So those things you learn and you grow on, what we've done in terms of providing for those students that have some great food need and insecurity is what we've been able to do with that, you know, consistently providing that. We have a one-to-one -one initiative that we actually moved up a year and a half. And that's like, that's one of the things I talk about a lot. It's like, we have this great technology plan and I, I'm like, I can't wait to one, one in two years, right? right? But yet there are all these kids who potentially could have lost these great opportunities. So literally one day we were waiting two years, one-to-one, -one, and the next day we're like, we're doing this next week. So every single student in the district got a device. Uh, but that still wasn't enough. Like, how do, how do we ensure connectivity? So uh, we had great business partners that came up. We got $100,000 from one association. We got $150,000 from a local church that tithed all their tithing. Uh, we got a grant through the state of Ohio. So we were able to honestly say any single student in our district that does not have activity the next day, they will. Uh, we know that the opportunities are not equitable yep. and certainly yep. across our region and state and so forth. So providing those equitable opportunities for students to have access to technology, access to books, to have access to learning, been so critical. And so we just kind of, you know, accelerated that, that plan, if you will, by making sure every single person had a device and connectivity and the know how to do so. Tom, you talked about being a visionary within the role of a superintendent and throughout your answers of 
the pandemic or post pandemic have talked a lot about you know your vision for partnerships with businesses and your vision for creating access to different resources. And I'm just curious with the vision piece, how do you go about that process? Is it something where you have your ideas on your own and then you venture out to various people within your departments? Or is it something that's collaborative? How, how as a superintendent, are you collaborating for a vision? Sure. I mean, the most important thing to do there is to have a diverse team. Uh, so we have an amazing cabinet, very, very diverse thinkers. And uh, we embrace and cherish dissension. I think when you dissent, you ultimately get to the right and the best possible solution. And I think that's something that so many leaders are missing, unfortunately. You know, they think they're the ones that have all the right answers. I'm, pr- I'm pretty lucky in this respect, Josh. I'm never the smartest person in the room, and I know that. You know, I'm able to embrace the ideas of other people. And I, again, not perfect. I'm not. But, you know, there, there's this great quote I, I reflect on quite a bit is that, you know, great leaders don't set out to leader. They set out to make a difference yep. it's about the role. It's always about goal and have it more about the vision, the mission. It's more about the little things, you know, a, a quick little anecdote. You know, I believe there's no job too small for me. And uh, I walked into school several years ago and there was, uh, must have been a party, you know, the night before, but there was some trash that was around, a custodian was off duty. And so the kids walking in saw this trash and so did the staff. And, you know, I went around and picked up a lot. In fact, I think just about all of it. And I walked in and the people, uh, there were people watching and they're like, hey, Mr. Burton, boy, you, you, you may have missed some trash out there. And I said, well, you know what? I'd love for you to tell me where it is because I'm going to pick it up and they're like we have somebody for that job and i said well we have about 350 400 kids walk in this door we had staff we had community members saw this why would we want something so beautiful to be desecrated with trash right. i know there was nobody on in the staff or no students it wasn't their fault but it's our responsibility so for me i'm going to pick up anything i see because that's what i believe leaders do and not surprisingly, I go back to that elementary school all the time. Never see any trash. Never. And actually, I see kids picking stuff up. I see adults picking stuff up. If there happens to be some trash there. And, uh, you know, it's the old adage, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, tremendous author and speaker. He's amazing. Uh, wrote books, Tipping Point, and Blink, and Outliers, David and Goliath, and the list goes on and on. But, you know, he talks about this uh, theory that the longer you leave up graffiti on a wall then it becomes acceptable. You know, it's not acceptable to have, have trash. It's not acceptable to have students not learning. It's not acceptable for so many things. It doesn't mean you have to be nasty about it, but I think the vision of having students own their learning, the vision of having teachers be innovative and creative and allowing more student voice is critical for all of us moving forward. And leaders allowing teachers, well, teachers are leaders too. I, I, don't, I don't want you to think that they're not. But if you look at a principal, a system principal, having a conversation with a teacher, if a teacher pushes back, it's not a bad thing. They're seeing it from a different perspective. Just like if a, if a principal pushes back on a director or a coordinator, it's not a bad thing. Or a director or coordinator push back on an assistant superintendent or associate superintendent, and they push back on me. Like we have to embrace the diversity of thought that actually has made our country great. Not necessarily where it is right now, where we're so bipolar and so polar opposite. We, we, we have to get closer together to have us grow. And if we in schools do that, we, I think, can advance not only our educational system, but we can advance society. Yeah, you make a great point, Tom, because I think a lot of times when you're building your leadership team, you're trying to find people like minded and you're also saying diverse thinking to kind of push back. And I'm just curious do you feel like a lot of leaders may feel uncomfortable with that? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And you know what happens? It's, it's funny. I was at a, uh, I listened to Daniel Pink the other day mm-hmm. and Daniel Pink talked about when people push back and there's some dissension or disagreement, however you want to phrase it. What happens is that if you're in a position of power, you become more powerful. You become more directive, right? right? Because you just want that person to listen. And we have to dial it back a little bit, you know, that power, that the, the, the typical nature of being aggressive. And, you know, it's 
it's not about titles. It's about influencing another. And it's not even necessarily a leader doing that to somebody who could be subservient. I don't even like that, but that's the way that some people think. Mm -hmm. We have to allow people, we have to allow authentic voice. We have to allow a st authentic student voice, staff voice, community voice. That drives not only a school, but it drives a governmental agency, like a city, a village, a township, a county, a state, and a country. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. With the last question for our dialogue here, I always love asking my leaders about aspiring leadership. This podcast was created for aspiring leaders and, and current leaders, but for those who are thinking about jumping into a leadership journey tomorrow or next week, what is something that they could do to enhance that journey? You know, you need to have, you need to be persistent uh, in your pursuit of knowledge. You need to have courage to be able to lead. It's not easy to lead. You need to have thick skin and be able to sacrifice and be able to be humble and be able to be humbled to have that determination and innovation is critical. And it's, there's so many things, like all of those could be specific positions. But, you know, one of the biggest things I will say is to make sure you have a network of people that support you and, you, and you're actually supportive in another network to be able to talk and, and have that. You know, I'm so blessed to have so many great professional friends and colleagues that I could reach out to. And that's something that we cannot express enough now more than ever with mental health permeating the mental health issues permeating all facets of education including leaders there are there's superintendents that i know they're great superintendents that literally said enough is enough and during the pandemic they were tired others said they're in the profession the stress is so great and you have to be able to reach out so i think having that network is critical but I also think like understanding where your comfort level lies in certain areas, I think is really important. And in the very beginning of this school year, when we had our leadership retreat, I gave every one of our leaders a journal, not an electronic journal, but a journal we actually write in. Uh, I personally believe the tactile nature of writing down thoughts, writing down concerns, issues, questions, allows you to process it deeper and differently. So again, for us to grow and learn and do things differently and to have educational environments like we should have, I think we need to think deeper, more reflectively, and not be afraid to confront, as Jim Collins says, the brutal facts of our current situation, which sometimes are really nasty, but we need to understand that and move on. Tom, I know outside of your superintendent role, you also have an opportunity to speak and keynote. So what are some of the topics that you'd like to hit on? Well, the, the only time I'll ever really kind of go out and do that is if there's some benefit that Princeton city schools will have. So uh, it wasn't too long ago, I was in Chicago, I did a keynote uh, in front of unbelievable leaders, educational leaders. I was humbled by the people who I met after. They're so incredible. But I spoke a lot about just innovation and kind of, uh, you know, the visionary vision that we need to have and we need to follow a mission statement that everybody can know and not a mission statement that's eight sentences long that nobody remembers and really kind of the ability to lead during turbulent times. Yeah. You know, there's that old adage that everybody can be a captain when the ship's in port. You know, it's <laughs> when it's out of port and you're, you're in, in encountering rough waves and no wind and so forth that kind of changes the ability to lead. So uh, having opportunities to do that, and I try to do some motivational and inspirational uh, speaking as well. You know, I'm doing a, a big equity conversation here coming up soon, doing a keynote for an education association in January that I'm really excited about. I'm talking in San Diego about questioning, and I did a TED Talk not too long ago, and it was all about resolution and resolve. I talked about the Latin phrase, noscate ipsum, which is to know thyself. And that to me is so critical. Like you have to know who you are. And if you do, then 
you can grow, you can do things differently. You can reflect and, and probably confront some regret along the way, if you know who you are, to be your best version of yourself that you possibly can be. So I kind of hit on all those in, in a keynote and kind of expand and try to make sure I'm meeting the needs of the organization or institution business that hired me. Tom, how can our listeners connect with you on social media? So my Twitter is uh, very simple. I'm very proud of being the superintendent of Princeton. I, I love our students. I love our staff, our communities. You know, Princeton's so crazy diverse in, in and of itself with our communities. We have two cities, four villages, three townships, part of three counties we represent too. So it's 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 crazy. And um, so there's nothing more fitting to me than our at Viking diff. And since I'm the superintendent at Viking Dipper is how they can connect with me on Twitter or Viking Diff one on Instagram. Uh, I'm also going to give out my cell phone too, in case anybody would want to reach out 440-708-4800. So anyway, reach out to me. I'd love to connect with people. Uh, help if I can, but also learn from some people who may have some different thoughts on things. Well, when Tom talks about connecting with other people to make yourself better, he's not saying that just as, as fluff. He really means it. So make sure that you're connecting with him on any of those social media outlets or even through a cell phone if you need it. So Tom, it's been such an honor to connect with you and to learn from you this evening. So I just appreciate you being on the Aspire podcast. Well, this I, I appreciate it. I love the name of that because that's really what we should do right? Fire to be the best that we can be, to learn, grow, learning never stops. And now uh, the biggest thing, if I may end with this, in my opinion, it's not about you. It's about the people that are around you, that want to be around you, that lift you up to help you and encourage, nurture, and push you to be the best. And i so blessed. I, I think I have the best team ever. I do that each and every day. So Josh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it.